I'm guessing that most of you have heard the advice so often attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt. Do something every day that scares you. I got a big check mark right now. <laughs> I'm not a fan of public speaking. But just to add to my angst, I plan to tell you a little bit of my own story. And it's, it's kind of rough around the edges. But it links directly to a much bigger story, that of a small but mighty group of women who came together with a deep commitment to being a part of addressing the addiction crisis in our community. I don't pretend to be an expert on the subject. But I have been to a place where many people have gotten lost, some to never return. And it is a hell that reminds me that while it's really important that we talk about things like Vivitrol and detox, needle exchange programs, and so forth, that it's just as important that we talk about where healing intersects with hope and purpose. So I'm going to begin at what was almost the end of my 10-year romance with alcohol, occasional love affairs with other substances. It was the first Friday of September 1978. My doctor entered my hospital room and he said, you're going home today. And I thought, well, I won't go to my home away from home, which was the local bar. Not because I thought I had a problem with alcohol. No, I was just totally humiliated. I wasn't that tough chick that I projected to my friends, or so I thought. <laughs> you see, on that previous Monday, I had woken up to the most beautiful, brilliant blue sky with great big billowing clouds stretched across the horizon. And it was the kind of scene that at one time my life would have given me such a surge of joy. Nature has always been my sanctuary, my place where I sense a higher power, the magic, the mystery of the universe, a healing balm in troubled times. But on that morning, <laughs> I couldn't even feel the tiniest little drop of awe. That connection had been unraveling for some time. And on that morning, it was like the final thread had been snipped and untethered from any kind of hope that I could pull myself out of the rut of my own dark thinking. I decided that my life really didn't matter that my four-year-old son would be better off without me. That's hard to say. And I went into my brother-in-law's room. The house was empty, and I removed his loaded revolver from a drawer, and I placed it at my temple. And I can't tell you how long I sat there with my hand trembling, my finger on the trigger ready to pull it but it was enough to make me shudder still today. And I want to stop because so many times people I know that have struggled with severe depression will say, I didn't have the guts to do it when they talk about wanting to kill themselves. Oh, that is not guts. That is despair and hopelessness and impulsivity. I did not do the thing that would have required guts. I didn't go and call for help. I went into the bathroom instead after putting the gun down, and I removed a bottle of aspirins. And with the beer I was drinking, I washed the entire contents down. My roommate came home sometime in that period, and I took out another bottle of aspirins and took the entire contents. And then came a razor blade. My last memory that morning in that house was of blood splattering across my son's bedroom wall as I was wrestled to a gurney. 
And now on the fifth day in the hospital, I was going home with no clue. Why am I even here? What is this insanity about? And that night, I did go to the bar. Because that's what we do when we're addicted. We keep doing the very same thing over and over again, causing our own self-destruction. And we lie to everyone around us, but the biggest lie is the lie we tell ourselves: it's not that bad. Tomorrow will be different. And when the biggest, saddest, most tragic thing about that is we believe it. We believe our own lies to ourselves. It wasn't until several months later when I was introduced to the recovery community that I began to understand that alcohol had become the centerpiece to my life. It was that the relationship to alcohol was the common denominator, it could connect the dots. I thought back to when I was 14 years old when life was difficult at home and alcohol was so much fun and it seemed like the answer was the solution to all my problems. But that solution had become my problem. In recovery, I was handed this blueprint, kind of roadmap, for how to navigate my way through life. Not just how to not pick up, but how to enjoy the journey how to be at peace inside my own skin. And I've been involved in that community ever since. Now, I'd be remiss in jumping from back then to now like, OK, everything's hunky-dory now. <laughs> you know, lived happily ever after. No. In the last 39 plus years, I've had more challenging situations come up in my life than in the previous 10. I think Forrest Gump put it so aptly, shit happens, right? <laughs> to all of us. It's just the nature of the beast, life, you know? But today I have this tool chest that I keep readily available. Keep it handy. I keep the tools sharp, try to make sure they don't get rusty. And one of the things that helped me so much, particularly in the beginning, but when those other hard things happened along the way, is a simple mantra, this too shall pass. And indeed, it always does. I was told early on that the best antidote to wanting to pick up was to work with someone still suffering. And several years back, I felt like that aspect of my own program needed a little B12 shot. And I began attending a weekly meeting at Southeastern Ohio Regional Jail that my dear friend Kate had begun. And there we sit in a circle with women all dressed in orange at their crossroads, roll of toilet paper handy, tossed as the tears began to fall inevitably. In emergency medicine, there's this term, the golden hour. That first 60 minutes after a serious accident has occurred and how survival and, and good outcomes, positive outcomes, can occur when that intervention happens in that window of time. These women have had a different kind of trauma. Many of them share with us that they've grown up in dysfunctional households, that their parents have started them on drugs that they've been sexually and physically abused as children and on up into adulthood. And without any numbing substances to, to dull that pain, they feel it, those memories. And the shame and the guilt and remorse for the mistakes made and the grief of being separated from children, the fear about the future, all that emotion brings some, not all, but some, to their knees and surrender. I can't live this way anymore. I cannot live this way anymore. I've got to change. I've got to break the cycle. 
And that is our golden moment, our golden hour there, because the psyche becomes fertile for the seeds of hope, of possibility, of encouragement to be planted. It's ripe. But too often, what makes me the most sad in these meetings is when someone speaks that earnest desire to change, but she doesn't feel confident because she knows she's going right back to that same household, neighborhood, where everyone she knows uses. Sam Keonis did an incredible job in the book Dreamland of explaining how our neighborhoods became so vulnerable to the drug culture because of the breakdown of our social fabric, because of economic factors. And many of those factors remain today. Women getting out of jail, treatment centers, prison, homeless shelters, domestic abuse homes, etc. They need a safe, supportive environment where they can hone the skills necessary to create this firm foundation of recovery. Not just to not get sober and clean, but to stay that way, to get off the relapse treadmill. There were others in the community really coming to this realization that we had a very critical need for recovery housing for women in Southeast Ohio at that same time. When a call to action went out in May of 2016, a grassroots effort evolved. It wasn't just me, as, as Steve had said. It was a group of women, strong women, said, we're going to do something about this. And by March of 2017, we were a formal nonprofit, Women for Recovery. And by July, we had purchased our house, named it Serenity Grove. And today, we are open with residents, with a paid staff member, with volunteers committed to helping women embark on this somewhat scary journey of change. The project has been scary for us. I, I think I speak for more than just me. Like, we can make this happen, really? Wow. We've had a lot of bumps along the way. But the support of our community, individuals and agencies have shored up our confidence. It's been instrumental in keeping us on the straight and narrow, the focus, our eyes on the prize. I began by telling you the story, my story, because I believe that stigma of addiction and mental illness creates this atmosphere where we can't talk openly about it. That it's hard for someone like me to ask for help. I was, in this community, so many people know me as Jana Lee the runner. Well, some of the things that were mentioned, I'm very opinionated, write the letters to the editor. <laughs> um, you know, the, the retired nurse. But you know what, I was re Jana Lee who, as a teenager, was on life support at one time, who another time woke up in a locked ward in a room that did not have a door that opened from the out, inside out, on a mattress with no sheet, no furniture, no windows, no nothing. I want people like me to know that radical change in the brain can happen. We don't have to be prisoners to our brain chemistry. Scientists know so much more about the way the brain works that yes, dopamine can make us a slave to food and drugs and alcohol and sex and gambling, but there are neurotransmitters that respond to exercise and fellowship and prayer and meditation and green space. Those are some of the tools that I keep in my tool chest. Change is very scary. By golly, it's worth it. You have to have a willingness to work for it.
with the number one cause of death in Americans under 50 being drug overdose, it's pretty rare that someone doesn't know someone who's been affected. I think when Eleanor Roosevelt advised, do something every day that scares you, she wasn't just talking about running a marathon or climbing Mount Everest, things that, you know, really make your heart go, whoa. She was talking about the way we think and perceive and open our minds and our hearts. If you don't know anyone that's been affected by these afflictions, then the challenge for you may be just to rethink how you think about us. Do you label us? Are we losers? Are we less than? Is someone getting out of prison destined to carry that label forever? Can you say to someone, I respect you for what you have been through. I haven't had the bad luck. I have the privilege that I didn't grow up that way. And boy, how do, do I respect you for being such a survivor. I have a friend like that who was in prison for 10 years. Thought the world of her. But I watched all the obstacles beat her down. And today she's back in prison, serving her time. And I respect her, and I'm rooting for her. I guess the biggest question that I ask myself, I think as a community we can ask ourselves, is can we love that person until they learn to love themselves again? I'm a believer we can. Thank you. Mm -hmm.